Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Spiritual Life Roundtable with Columbia faculty and community members. My, life is, my name is Melissa Mayard, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the Office of the University Life, and I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Before we get started, I would like to take this time to do a land acknowledgement created by Columbia University School of Nursing. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Lenape people on which we learn, work, and gather today at Columbia University. Lenape means real person or original person. And it is important to remember that Lenape collectively are a living and breathing community. Let us honor their legacy. Let us commit ourselves to the struggle against forces that have dispossessed the Lenape and other indigenous people of their lands. We stand strong in our commitment to support and defend all marginalized people of this land who have been stripped of their rights to self-determination. Thank you to Columbia's nursing school who issued this acknowledgement. We encourage you to find out more about local indigenous territories and languages which you are sitting on in this moment. We're adding to the chat now the resource nativeland.ca by the nonprofit organization Native Land Digital to learn more about indigenous territories, treaties, and languages across the world. Again, thank you for joining us today. This event is part of University Life's Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, which promotes Columbia's commitment to diversity and success of all graduate and professional school students, and is co-sponsored by none other than the Office of Religious Life. University Life's diversity roundtables, such as this one, aim to provide opportunities for students, faculty, and staff to have informal yet meaningful conversations through open discussions on critical student life issues. This event will hopefully reinforce that you belong here, that there are multiple ways to build community and that you too can thrive while working towards your own academic goals. Before I turn it over to our esteemed panelists and moderator, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this program will be recorded and shared via University Life's YouTube channel. If you have any questions about this recording, please contact our office. Also, please make sure to remain muted. Towards the end of the round table, there will be an opportunity for questions. And we ask that you type your questions in the chat box so that we can answer as many as possible, or use the raise your hand feature to unmute yourself and ask your question there. We also recommend that you keep your view on speaker view versus gallery view. Now I'd like to turn it over to our partner for this round table, Reverend Dr. Ian Rottenberg, Dean of Religious Life and Director of the Earl Hall Center, who will introduce our panelists. Dr. Rottenberg. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I echo your words of welcome to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. We're so glad that you're here. And I just have one job, which I'm honored to do, which is to introduce the amazing panelists and moderator for this session. And, and as I do this, you know, it's you, you'll hear again at Columbia, amazing people that we have access to. And I, I encourage you to look up each of the panelists to get to know them. They're real human beings in and around Columbia's campus and virtual world right now and wonderful resources for all of you as graduate students. Uh, what an amazing university we're a part of where you can actually get a diverse religious conversation going. And so savor the amazing reality of what we're doing speaking across traditions today. Today, as I share with you our information about our panelists today. First, we have Professor Ari Goldman. Ari, thank you for being with us. Ari is a professor of journalism and has taught at the Journalism School since 1993. He's the director of the school Scripps Howard Program in Religion, Journalism, and Spiritual Life. The Scripps Program has enabled Professor Goldman to take students in his Covering Religion seminars on funded study tours abroad during spring break. In the past, his class has visited India, Russia, Ukraine, Ireland, Italy, Israel, Jordan, and the West Bank. In addition to the religion seminar, Professor Goldman also teaches reporting, the master's project, and the course, The Journalism of Death and Dying, which looks at everything from writing obituaries to covering natural disasters and suicide. It is an honor to have you with us, Professor Goldman. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce to you all Lam Hui, Lam is a theoretical physicist interested in the fundamental aspect of black holes, dark matter, and the Big Bang. His career started with doctoral study at MIT, followed by postdoctoral research at Fermilab Chicago and the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Lam is currently a professor in the physics department at Columbia, where he's been thinking about black hole perturbations in the past year, thanks to the support 
uh, by a, a Simons Fellowship. Next, we have uh, Hussein Rashid, who is one of uh, the one of two panelists, I think, who was also uh, in your role at one point as a student uh, at Columbia University. Hussein's a lecturer in the Department of Religion, a contingent faculty member who's taught at Hofstra, Fordham, Iona, Virginia Theological Seminary, Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, and SUNY Old Westbury. His research focuses on Muslim, Muslims and American popular culture. He writes and speaks about music, comic, movies and the Blogistan. He also has background in South and Central Asian studies with a deep interest in uh, Shi'i justice theology. His current pro project focuses on the role of technology and teaching religion. And finally, we have our, our final panelist is Simranjit Singh. Simran is a lecturer and a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary and a religious life advisor at the Office of Religious Life in addition to having been a graduate student who got his PhD from Columbia. He's recognized among Time Magazine's 16 people fighting for a more equal America and a senior advisor for equity and inclusion at YSC Consulting. He's a 2020 Equality Fellow with the Open Society Foundations and a senior fellow for the Sikh Coalition. This past year, Simran added author to his resume with the release of a best-selling children's book from Penguin Random House called Fauja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He's currently completing an adult nonfiction book for Penguin Random House entitled More of the Please, Sick Wisdom for the Soul. And finally, but certainly not least, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator who will take it from here. We're so grateful to have Adina Berrios Brooks. Adina is currently the Assistant Provost for Faculty Advancement in the Office of the Vice Provost, where she is responsible for faculty development programming, data analysis, program evaluation, communications, and special events for the office. Prior to this role, Adina worked at admissions and student affairs at Columbia, both the undergraduate and graduate levels for over a, de a decade. Most recently at Columbia Engineering as the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions and Student Affairs for the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department. I know that you will all join me in appreciation and thankfulness for all of our panelists and I'll turn it over to Adina. Oh, thank you so much, Ian. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here and listening to the introductions of all of our panelists. I'm really eager to hear from each and every one of them. Um, and I'm going to start, jump right in and ask that maybe that for the first round, at least the panelists answer in the order they were introduced with the first question, which is, so all of us navigate multiple identities in a university setting. Can you share some ways that you have found yourself needing to navigate or negotiate between your religious and academic identities. And Ari, I think we'll start with you. Unmute myself so you could hear. Um, how do I negotiate? Um, I teach in the School of Journalism and I started life as a journalist. I was a reporter, a reporter at the New York Times. And um, I've started these negotiations early in my career. Um, I, am, I have one hat as a, as a journalist and another hat uh, in my personal religious life. I'm an Orthodox Jew, which means I have certain um, um, restrictions on my, on my daily life in terms of my, um, my diet, my uh, religious practice, uh, what governs the rhythms of my life. And uh, those um, are very dear to me and very enriching to me personally. Um, at the same time, I'm a reporter um, who has to um, cover the world, cover people who are very different from me and whose values might clash with mine. So I'm, um, I'm an old hand at putting those two sides of me, um, 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 sort of negotiating between those two sides of me. And that um, was uh, uh, an easy step to uh, academic life where I began to teach and where I still, I come with my own ideas, but yet I feel as a, as a, as a uh, faculty member and someone who serves the broader community, I have to put some of my own ideas aside for, um, for those times when I have uh, a different mission. And um, I've, I've come with, um, with uh, the idea of, diversity and appreciating the other is something I've worked on my whole life. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that. 
um, um, as, as, as the afternoon progresses. Thank you. Lam, if we could turn to you, please, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, thank, thank the organizers for getting us together. Um, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist and it's, uh, it's almost, uh, how should I say, it's almost taken for granted. A scientist should not talk about religion or his faith. Um, so at some level, at some level, it's kind of a, a, an interesting question uh, uh, that you're asking. Um, you know, the, 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 my, my discipline is, you know, is, um, how should I say, is the, the study of phenomena that are re repeatable, that can be quantified and measured, and for which we seek uh, natural explanations, right? So it's almost like from the very beginning, the definition of my field is to exclude religion. And so it, it, it seems, uh, in, in fact, I would say, you know, in my, um, in my community, uh, very often scientists just avoid discussing religion altogether. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Scientists are human beings, you know? There are questions that we all care about, you know, whether you are a scientist or not, like uh, questions of meaning, questions of uh, morality, ethics, for which actually, uh, for the most part, science doesn't really have answers to those questions, uh, but those are questions we deeply care about, all of us, um, whether you are a, a person of faith or not. Or not. Um, and, and therefore, um, there is a, a little bit of, um, how should I say, at least perceived conflict between those two kind of, you know, how should I say, different spheres of, um, of your life. Uh, on the other hand, my, my, own, my own view is there's really no real conflict. Uh, probably, probably an analogy might, might be helpful here. Let's say you are a, a musician, a violinist, for example, uh, for sure, what part of your um, part of the skills that you need to master is to just to put your finger at the right place on the string to just sound even the right note. That's very important. Uh, on the other hand, um, clearly, uh, performing music is much more than that. Uh, there's um, there's there's beauty and meaning in the music that's beyond just the mere skill of sounding the right note. Right. So those two things actually come together in a musical performance in a, in, a, in a beautiful way. And I actually see what I do basically in a very similar way. Um, that's part of our pursuit, uh, you know, the, uh, the search for truth, for scientific truth that requires kind of, in some sense, limiting the kind of questions you are asking. In fact, that's actually part of why science is so powerful because we intentionally limit what we can ask and how we can approach those questions. And because of the, 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 way, the, uni the way the universe is, that is governed by uh, mathematical laws. So that particular kind of uh, self-limiting approach, if you want, actually uh, produces a lot of amazing progress that we all, you know, we all know about and we benefit from. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, I think I think it's useful to keep in mind that it is a self-limiting approach, meaning it, you know the fact that it's so powerful and so successful should not then you be taken to mean that well there to mean that 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 is all there is to it, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what makes our life meaningful, what uh, what are the what are, what are the right things to do? What are the uh, wrong things to do? Um, our human life is much more than that. So, so um, yeah, I, I think I think um, you know, in terms in terms of um, kind of integrating, if you want, integrating uh, my my professional life as a scientist and uh, my life as a as a human being, my, my faith is a Christianity. I'm a Christian. Um, I, I don't really see there is any inherent conflict, actually. In fact, uh, maybe later on, if we have time, I can tell you more about my personal experience. In fact, I very much think of it as 
as as the analogy that I gave you, there's there are certain moments in my professional life I very feel much like a, a musician where uh, I I am I'm carrying out the skills or performing uh, according to the way I I'm, I was trained. On the other hand, there's a part of what I do that is actually deeply meaningful to me in a way that is spiritual. Yeah, I think I'll just leave it as that for now. Yeah. I must say that's such a beautiful image, and um, yeah, musician m music is a type of faith in a way too. So I think it's it actually is so appropriate. Um, Hussein, I'm going to turn to you with the same question about navigating your religious and academic identities. Yeah, thanks, Adina. Um, so first of all, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, I I feel uh, like it was fortuitous that I'm coming after both Ari and Lam um, because. What it was for me as a Columbia undergraduate to navigate that space of religion and academia and what it led to me being, I think, is it pulls on both their experiences. So I myself am a Muslim and, uh, you know, we have certain dietary restrictions. Uh, so, you know, if we would go to the dining hall, is there pork in the food or is it cooked on the same plate as, as pork? So, you know, I come from a school that says as long as you say God's name over it, it's it's halal in the U.S. because everything's corporate meat culture. Anyway, remember, this was a while ago. I won't tell you how long because Adina and I are classmates and I'm not going to give away somebody else's age. Uh, exactly. So, uh, but, uh, you know, so navigating food and food culture on campus um, several years ago uh, was uh, was more difficult then than it is, I think, now on campus, um, but also socializing. Uh, you know, what is now Hex and Company, and before that was Bernheim and Schwartz. Uh, what was it, West End before? Yeah, West End. Um, you know, that was a big social spot. And uh, again, I don't drink. And as long as I went in with a group of people who were drinking, the bartender never made a thing about just giving me my club soda. Uh, but if I was just there to get a club soda, I'd always get a nasty look. So, you know, it's like, you know, so navigating that space and trying to find other spaces and other ways to socialize. And so really finding, you know, after probably the first month or so, finding my people on campus and, uh, through the BSO, uh, through at the time it was called the United Students of Color Council, what eventually became the Asian American Alliance, um, and really coordinating, you know, with other people who had, if not for religious reasons, cultural restrictions around their dietary habits as well. Uh, JSU events, Jewish student events were always big with me because you always knew the food was good to eat and safe to eat. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, that was the ways in which we, we started navigating that. But really understanding that institutions, uh, and I would argue even now, are not equipped to deal with difference from a presumed white male Protestant and, and hetero norm. Um, and so what are the ways in which we navigate that space? Are they getting better? Yes, and this is not a Columbia thing. I think anybody who's worked in any institution recognizes this. But is it getting better? Yes, but still we have to negotiate and we have to figure out how to do that. The other thing um, that I learned is I came into Columbia um, as a biology major. I was pre-med, I was working in, uh, uh, um, uh, I was really interested in evolutionary genetics and uh, really because of the focus on humanity sort of brought me back into religion, oddly enough, but not just because I had a really great professor uh, when I was taking my Islam course with uh, Peter on God rest him or with Rachel McDermott who's still there uh, on Hinduism, uh, but because I had this most amazing biology professor. And I think I took about half my courses with him, uh, Bob Pollock, who um, is very open uh, about his religious, Jewish religious commitments and being really one of the most amazing articulate uh, biologists I've ever had the privilege of meeting and working with and, and also being interested in pedagogy, which was, you know, sometimes is rare in, high, in higher education, but, you know, sort of engaging with that question of how can you have two systems of knowledge that are often portrayed in conflict? And I think, Lam, this is what you were hinting at, the sort of scientific systems of knowledge or sci uh, scientific mm -hmm. systems and religious systems, or are there ways in which they're in fact complementary? And I think with uh, with Bob, I had the privilege of seeing what that looked like in practice rather than just in theory and allow me to sort of expand my way. So uh, my ways of seeing the world and organizing knowledge. And I, and I think, so for me, how did I navigate that is really being blessed with having some amazing people who, who opened that way for me and made that possible. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're going to go now to Simon, please. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, like Hussein, I'm, I'm glad to go after all of you. So, so you all said all the smart things, um, and I can just say whatever I want now. Um, and, and and what I want to say is essentially um, all, all of the above feels feels true for me. And and you know one of one of the different aspects of my experience that that might resonate with others and I'd be interested to hear what you all have to say about it um, is that the the experience of being a religious minority uh, uh, at Columbia um, made it very difficult in, in some ways uh, to separate out uh, the academic experience uh, from the lived experience. And, and what I mean by that is, and, and, and you'll, you'll hear this also from, from people of other kinds of identity groups, right? Not just on the basis of religion, but when you're part of a, an underrepresented group, um, you have to, I mean, you, you have to sort of create your own path in so many ways. And, and what does that look like? I mean, I, I think if we look at what happens with our students group, student groups, um, they are they are creating structures that don't exist elsewhere a lot of the times, right? Like the the Columbia six student group uh, that I worked with as when I was a student and, and work with now. Uh, there's no national organizing body. There's no um, there's no funding allocation that comes from elsewhere. Um, they they have to every year these students have to put it all together on their own, and they do a fantastic job. But it's quite a lift. Uh, and it comes in addition to what they're doing otherwise. And so having to carry that burden um, as, as a sort of member of a marginalized group, uh, it, it precludes you from ever really being able to take a step back. You're constantly, and, and this was my experience as a student, and, and I feel it now too, you're constantly trying to figure out what, what should I be doing so that my voice is heard or our community's voice is heard. Because if you, you know that if you don't, uh, nothing will happen and you won't have the opportunities that, that you know that your community needs. And so it's, it's a question of, of what it takes to become visible in, in a context where you know historically, not just at the institution where you belong, but culturally, uh, your community has been rendered invisible. And so you know from your collective memory and your communal, communal experience um, that, it, that if I don't take this on myself, then, then there is no opportunity for others, but also for me. And, and so I'll, I'll just give one more example here of, of what this looks like. And that is, you know, one of, one of the, the very specific reasons I came to Columbia as a graduate student is because I wanted to study Sikh history and there was essentially nowhere in the country where I could go. And I come to Columbia and, and there are some experts in early modern uh, Indian religion there, uh, specifically in North India, some of the best experts in the world and the languages and the cultures that I'm interested in. And even then, there's nobody who specializes in, in, in the tradition I wanted to study with it, which is the world's fifth largest. And so what does, what does that say to you, not just about uh, our own institution, but about this larger structure of our society um, where you, you, you show up as, as this professional at this elite institution and you still have to create your own path? Um, and, and you still have to sort of assemble all these resources, figure out which classes you're in. I, I took uh, courses in, in India and I had to do a semester in California uh, in order to, to get what I needed. I had to bring in a, uh, committee members from all over. And it's, this is not just my experience. This is, this is for others. So, so as we're thinking about what equity looks like uh, for people of, of religious minority groups, I think that's a really important question of, of what, do, what do resources look like for these groups? And, and a lot of times uh, the groups that are hurting the most are the ones that we don't even think about uh, in terms of how resource allocation grows. So I'll pause there. Thank you for all of that. So my next question actually builds off of some of the points that you just made and, and Zane made as well. Um, as you look at the experiences of current students on the Columbia campus, um, how do you see them navigating their religious identities, you know, in the, in the current environment? And in particular, um, 
what do you think that students are doing that you're sort of impressed with that you think is successful? You're like, oh, I wish I had done that um, or and or um, where do you see real challenges, whether institutionally or just places where students kind of get stuck as they're as they're doing some of the the things that you know you all have talked about in your own personal experience now kind of on the role as a faculty member and, and a grown up and who's saying yes I will not tell your age if you don't tell mine. Um, you know what are you seeing in those experiences with, with the students that you work with and anyone that's a jump ball anyone can jump in. Um, if, if I could jump in here for a second, because I think Simranjit said something that I really want to spin off of about being from a marginalized religious community. Um, you know, back when I was an undergraduate, uh, there was a, it wasn't easy being a Muslim on campus, not from non-Muslims, but from other Muslims, because you are struggling to create that identity. And sometimes it defaults to a very reactive, a very uh, defensive posturing that becomes very exclusionary. And I think one of the things the university has done and done well is building out the chaplaincy program uh, uh, at the university. I think putting in a Muslim chaplain has really changed the tenor for Muslim students on campus, what is possible, um, how, how students see themselves in relationship to the university. You know, they're not navigating in spite of the university, but they're navigating perhaps with or against the university. But I, I have to tell you, as somebody who was involved in, in ethnic studies protests on campus, like being involved against the university is actually really important because it means the university sees you too, as opposed to benign neglect, right? And, and so I think that, that you, know, you have processes and you can fight those processes, but it means that in some capacity you're engaged. And so I think the chaplaincy uh, having a chaplain, Muslim chaplain on campus, and I would urge it for, for as, as, as many religious traditions as feasibly possible, has really done something for the way the university sees its students and the students see themselves in relationship to the university. Um, the flip side of it is when I first joined Columbia's faculty um, as an adjunct, I was actually filling in for a colleague who was on sabbatical. And um, he, he was Muslim. Um, and so I had students, Muslim students were like, you were the first Muslim faculty member I've had at Columbia. And this is like juniors and seniors telling me this. And, and I actually had one student who told me that I was the first uh, faculty of color they had in their, in their four years here as well, which I, you know, I won't get into, but, you know, I, I, I think speaks to still how, you know, so I'm, let's say a generation off the current set of students. I think for me not to have a Muslim faculty member is radically different than students now not having a Muslim faculty member. Because in my peer group alone, there were literally dozens of Muslims who went through PhD programs in Islamic studies or religious studies. And when I, when I do teach at Columbia slash Barnard, I'm teaching often broader religion courses. I do teach a couple of Islam courses, but I teach like religion and popular culture, religion at the movies. And so these Muslim students actually aren't learning how to navigate that space. And again, the religious studies classroom isn't necessarily that space, but we all know that the community happens outside the classroom as well. So how are they having the ability to have these conversations that we're having here right now if they never meet the faculty in the first place? So, so to me, these are some of the institutional issues that, that are on my mind as I'm in thinking through these questions you're posing. I'll jump in with something real quick. I, I promise to keep it quick. Um, the, the chaplaincy issue, I, I think, is a huge one. And, and I'll just explain very quickly um, how it worked out on my side as, as a way of illustrating what an expanded view of inclusion looks like. Um, so when I was a graduate student, the, the six students actually petitioned to have a, a chaplain on campus. And, and the requirements then were in order to do so, you have to have X, Y, Z expectations. And, and one of the challenges we had and that other religious groups have uh, is that we don't have the same infrastructure uh, as traditions as, as Christianity. And so those expectations are very much born out of a normative understanding of Christianity and, and then assumed to be true for all religious groups. But in our we don't even have chaplains. We don't even have clergy. And so what does it look like to have a quote unquote sending organization, which we, we don't have those structures either. And so at, when I was a graduate student, it was immediately just shut down. 
And the students were told this is not a possibility and it's not a priority um, because you don't meet the expectations. Okay. And then fast forward about 10 years and, and the, the model completely flips. I got, I got a phone call from Ian when he started in the position and he said, um, this is a priority for us. What are the barriers and how can we overcome them? And so I very quickly laid out what the obstacles were for our community, why it wouldn't work or why it didn't work the last time. And it was just one, two, three. If those are the rules and the rules don't work for everyone, let's change the rules. And so I think, I think that is something that I've seen happen at Columbia. And it, it makes me feel like, uh, you know, you, you can understand that change is possible when you, when you see it happen before your eyes. And so it gives me, it gives me a little bit of hope. I, I know the institution has a long way to go, but I, I think Hussein's right that this this shift in approach has actually done uh, something really remarkable uh, on the campus for, for religious minority groups. I see one other thing that I'd like to point out. Uh, it's a little different, maybe it's the flip side of what um, Hussein and Sirman have been talking about, but it's not students who wanna be visible and want um, representation and want a presence. There are a lot of students who wanna be invisible. Students who don't want to be defined by their um, hijab or their yarmulke or their cross. Um, um, I know Jewish students who don't, who feel that their politics um, and people's impression of their politics on Israel Palestine are shaped by the fact that they're observant Jews because not everyone feels the same way. Um, yeah, I, I had a Muslim student who, um, uh, who had been a Jewish studies major. Um, people surprise you every day. And um, I think one of the things that we have to be careful about is having expectations of students that come, that are born out of our own impression or idea of what they should be rather than who they are. So um, yes, there are, there are those who, who want to be visible and want to join and want to be part of a, uh, of a cause, but there are also those who um, are finding their way. And I think uh, we have to give them that space and shouldn't weigh or load our expectations on their shoulders. It's a great point you raised, Avi, um, kind of responding to that general point about students wanting different things. Um, there, is, um, there, there, is a, there is a Yale theologian that, whose, whose views actually influence me a lot. His name is uh, Miroslav Bohm. Let me use his... Uh, I'm going to use his terminology. Um, you know, for, for, for us people of faith, uh, often we try to navigate between two extremes. One extreme is um, faith that is coercive. Uh, the other extreme is faith that is idle, that somehow we try to uh, navigate exactly where in the spectrum we want to be. Uh, I mean, for good reasons, we, we, we try to, a lot of us, not, not, all, not, not, not all of us by any means, but a large fraction of us try, try to be invisible in maybe in the sense that, that I already mentioned, in the sense that we are, we are kind of um, wary of uh, creating conflicts or imposing our opinions on others. And therefore, uh, that, that's, that's the attempt to avoid being the core, you know, being coercive, the coercive uh, uh, end of the spectrum. On the other hand, there is um, the, uh, the, pos the possibility that one is so private about one's faith that um, not only is it invisible to others, uh, at times it might be invisible to ourselves. Uh, it doesn't actually impact our life in meaningful ways. Um, and, and I think we are poorer for it. So that there is some, 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 uh, some very uh, probably difficult balancing act that you know we are all trying to navigate. Um, on the whole, my at least in my field, you know, in, in the field of science, I think most often we err on the side of of trying to stay away from being coercive, meaning we we tend to be extremely private. Uh, I don't. I don't know to, to what extent is true in other areas, but certainly in my field, that we tend to be tend to be true. And I think I think we lose out a little bit because of that. Meaning, 
we could have extremely useful and meaningful conversations if we just be a little bit less shy, actually. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you for that. I actually like to build off of that last point um, with my next question. Um, which, so the official question was, how would we make our campus a more inclusive place for all students? And I think we've touched upon some ways that's happened and could happen. But I think the point that was just made about you know, what is lost if we don't do that is an important piece of it. So I would love to hear your thoughts on how we could do that and, and, and a little bit more about why that's important to us. And, and, and I think also if you could tie it back um, to the issue of our humanity. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot during COVID about humanity and what does that mean and, and how much do we think about that? And so if you could talk a little bit about how, if we made the campus more inclusive, how we could have more of the, that kind of dialogue potentially and what, a little bit more about what you meant by that. That would be fantastic. Maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, to be honest, I, re I don't know. Uh, partly because I'm actually not, uh, not, not so used to even talking about my own faith uh, in front of other people. So I'm, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm actually learning uh, but I do think, and I agree with you, that there is um, there's uh, there's there's great benefit in having having dialogue. Um, I think we learn from each other, um, and I, I I believe, you know, there there is there is wisdom uh, in our different traditions, and we can. Uh, um, that, there's great benefit in sharing that wisdom. The question is how to do it uh, in a way that is constructive. Um, and probably a few things, you know, a few things to remember is useful, right? So I think in each of our faith traditions, there are there are um, there are teachings or there are beliefs that would help us uh, be uh, be, be loving and kind towards each other, be uh, striving towards peace. And I think it's important we reach into our tradition to reinforce that, that is important. And the other thing that is important is uh, when, when we feel uh, ready to, let's say, share wisdom from our own tradition, we should also be ready to receive wisdom from other traditions. That's important. Um, and, and it's also important to recognize there are boundaries. You know, we we like to we like to think. Uh, I think part of part of the great thing about diversity is, of course, uh, having many different points of views, uh, many different uh, culture and perspective. And and it's important to acknowledge there are boundaries, meaning there are differences between different points of views. Uh, one one should not actually sweep that under the rug. On the other hand, I think it's important to recognize. Somehow those boundaries are permeable. Um, we can actually reach across boundaries and understand each other. I don't have much, much uh, by way of practical, you know, advice or suggestion because it's something that I myself am uh, navigating. Being on a campus is such a great opportunity. Um, we're spoiled because we get to <clears throat> come back here every year, but. Um, I, I, I have to stop and remember that our students are here you know, like in the journalism school for a year and the college for four years, you know, um, and the law school for three years or how as, ever, as many years are gonna be here. It's really limited. It's a short part of their lives and it's an opportunity for them to be exposed to a lot of different ways of, of thought. Um, before they go off into the rest of their lives, which could be broad or could be more narrow. Um, but the opportunities here um, are, are ones that we should uh, hope and encourage them to take advantage of and to explore beyond their own um, um, you know, familiar uh, disciplines, be, you know, their, their 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 familiar faith, uh, you know. So I think, like you know, the the um, interfaith engagement is really important. The mixing 
having roommates who are different than you, having classmates who are different than you um, is, is such an important part of the experience of being here and one that we should foster. Um, and I've seen it because I, I teach a course in um, an unusual course in, in journalism schools. Uh, there are just a few like it on covering religion. How do you write about religion for a general audience? And it's a very important course, I think, because there's so much bad journalism about religion and a lot of stereotyping and a lot of ignorance and a lot of sensationalism and trying to teach um, graduate students in religion to be sensitive to the to these questions and um, knowledgeable about different religions is just um, my mission here at Columbia. And in doing that, I get to expose them to ideas that are um, that are new to them. Sometimes they're, um, uh, as Lamb said, they're, they, they don't know enough about themselves, but sometimes it's to expose them to their own um, um, religious tradition and history. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's to expand their, 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 their scope of knowledge. So I, I, I think that's something that should be taking place. Um, you know, if it takes place in religion, it should take place in the sciences and in, and in the humanities where we just open up to different ideas and are challenged by them and sometimes affirmed by them and sometimes always, I hope, change, changed by them. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up from there. And and um, are you? I, I think you're you're exactly right. And when you're talking about um, the the opportunity here uh, that comes through that comes through more inclusion. And uh, Adina, I love I love the way you asked the question of, of what do we lose when we don't do it? Because as as someone who comes from a, a tradition uh, that is. Um, largely unknown, uh, despite being a large tradition. Um, I, I know firsthand the consequences of what it means to not be known um, and how, um, how vulnerable our communities become uh, when religious literacy is not part of their uh, understanding. And, and you know, as, as a society, we don't do well generally uh, when it comes to any kind of cultural literacy, right? Like we don't, we don't know about one another, we don't care about one another. Uh, and that leads to all sorts of problems. Uh, but there's there's a particular problem that I can speak to from my own personal experience, and, and, and Hussein can too, uh, about what happens to a community uh, that is underrepresented, misrepresented, misunderstood, and, and the violence that ensues, uh, and what that means for your everyday safety, not just, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking in the abstract of like, oh, those people over there, I'm talking about the people in our communities on the campus who are worried about showing up as they are and letting people know. I mean, that's another aspect, Ari, of, of your point that some people don't wanna be known uh, on the basis of their religious identities because sometimes they, they feel targeted uh, and that, they're, that they're, there's real reason for that. And so what are the stakes? I mean, I think those are the stakes and, and I felt them myself uh, at different points in my life. It feels especially sharp uh, right now in, in, in the wake of, of a few uh, mass shootings in which six have felt targeted. Um, and, and we do see uh, inclusion as a solution to that, right? So, so we've, we've talked primarily in this conversation about what it feels like uh, to be left out and, and what it feels like to be represented. Um, but, but there's also another part of the equation, which is what happens to those in our communities when they get a sense uh, of their neighbors. Uh, and that's and that's part of the the benefit of inclusion as well. And so, um, yeah, I, I, as as you're talking about the stakes, Adina, like why does this matter? To me, it's it's quite literally for for us on the margins, but also for everyone in our community, uh, it could very well be the difference between life and death. Uh, and 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 I, I I don't want to undersell that, and I don't want to be sensational about it. But it's true for for so many of us. We we think about physical safety. Uh, Hussein and I talk about that with our families. Like, what do we do for our kids raising them in this world where we know they're going to be targets just like we have? And so, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I, I do think that the stakes are incredibly high that, that we get this right because we haven't yet. Um, let me pick up from there, um, Sabrinjith, because as you're talking about that point of safety, 
Um, the first death threat I ever got was at Columbia after organizing a, a vigil after the Hebron massacre uh, by, at that time it was called the JDL, who promised money to the next Baruch Holstein who killed the man who was putting together this vigil. Um, so that was, uh, you know, it's a, it's a long-standing issue for some reason. Um, but, uh, you know, I think you, Ari, you mentioned how religion is covered and Simranjit, you talked about religious literacy. And I think that for me, yes to everything everybody said so far, but when we start putting those elements together, right, religion is not separable from any other aspect of human endeavor or human life. It's not like it's not bounded by class and economics. And as we're looking, and I, I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but I think we have to mention a manal here right, um, of four guys of questions of gender uh, as well, and how does this fit in? Uh, you know, I, I think um, that one of the things we have to look at then is when we look at things like DEI initiatives, right, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, are they necessary steps? Yes, because of where we're at right now. But what often happens is that they become uh, fossilized and structured and really are co-opted to reinforce the systems that exist and say, okay, we have, we do quota systems or we do checks and uh, we're doing the right thing. So nobody's a jerk in the office anymore. And we know how to report the jerks in the office. Uh, but the, the college experience to Ari's point is how, is, is that's the point where I learned to navigate difference in a very serious way, right? Because of who we lived with, because of who we were in class with. But once you leave college, it's not durable because that's not the way society is set up. And yes, it is a laudable goal, but I don't think you can continue to be passive. I think that, that institutions, universities, workplaces have, uh, or, or civic society institutions, they have an obligation to think about how do we institutionalize dealing with the difference um, and making difference normative, right? So that, that you can actually talk about and with and across difference. Um, because I think that's where we're struggling because it's not, you know, if, I, if I've been doing interface for the last 20 years, great, what does that teach me about racial difference or gender difference or uh, sexual identity, right? But as opposed to uh, a broader set of tools, you talked about religious literacy, how do we think about literacy around difference and how do we practice that? How do we make that durable? Uh, and how do we move so that we're forced in intentional ways to come together uh, across these lines? Um, again, not to force the invisible to become visible or the visible to become invisible, but where people are in their comfort levels to come forward and to meet in those spaces. Um, and I think that's part of the obligation of universities now. Again, I'm using that as a, uh, a metonym for institutions writ large, but how do we take that intentionality uh, to say, how are you engaging with difference and what does this look like after you leave here? Thank you for that. Um, so just as a time check, I would love any questions from folks who are here in the audience um, in the chat or you can use the raise your hand function. I have one last one that's kind of burning on my mind before I, we open it up to that, which um, I would love for any of the panelists who feel willing to talk about a time in your life when you were particularly brave in this space and how, wh how you did that, why you did that, um, how it worked. Um, you know, more as kind of an advice to hopefully any of the, the folks that are here in the audience about what that might look like on the individual level. And Hussein, I want to acknowledge what you said about the institutional piece. I think that's important. But I think we also are individuals as part of this institution. And so how can we model, you know, the behavior that we're looking for? And if you have any kind of examples you might want to share, that would be probably really valuable. Yeah, I can I can go back to that example I gave um, of the of the phone call uh, that I received from Ian saying we're we're looking at setting up a chaplaincy or expanding our chaplaincy. What would it, what would it take? And and I uh, am not a confrontational uh, type of person, and and I'm not antagonistic. Um, and and I I very much felt like I should hold my tongue. That that was my initial impulse, and just say you know here here are the six students, and and here's here's what you would need, but. Um, I, you know, the reason that I felt um, ready to go in that moment, I, I, there were two things. One is, um, it was the first time that somebody had come to me uh, from the university and said, what do you need? What do you want? Uh, so that's really different. And it feels really different in the moment because for the first time, I didn't feel like I was fighting to be heard, felt like somebody actually wanted to listen to me. Um, and I saw in him 
an ally. And, and it was a continued conversation. He came back over and over again and said, here's where we are, here's what I'm doing. Um, and so it felt like there was a partner in the effort. And, and I think the, those two things were, were really big lessons for me in terms of how I try and operate uh, in this space now. To, 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 to be proactive, I think is key. Uh, we don't typically see that at, at, at any sort of big institution, but, but especially in the university space. Um, and, and then second, uh, to once you find the ally um, who is willing to be an advocate for you, uh, to then to then go in, go all in with them. And, and, and I think, you know, to, to see that come to fruition gave me a lot more trust uh, in how that could work. But, but especially in the moment, uh, that, that sort of feeling of here is somebody who is invested because they care about the, the overall health of the institution, like there are people like that. Uh, I think that that really opened up a different kind of door for me and, and allowed me to, to, to step up in a way that I hadn't before. Thank you for that. I have no stories of personal bravery, but I'll tell you about my lunch today. I had lunch with a friend who stopped wearing his yarmulke, his kippah in public because he's afraid um, in New York. And um, he's been wearing one for years um, he happens to be visiting from Israel, but whenever he comes to New York, he wears it. And he said, my wife said, I can't, and my wife warned me. And um, he looked at me sadly and said, because he's also associated with the university. And he said, can you imagine if Sikhs couldn't wear their turban and, and Muslims, Muslim women couldn't wear the hijab or Christians couldn't wear the cross, how it would be a place we wouldn't want to be at. Right? It wouldn't be the kind of um, environment that we want to um, live in and practice. And it's, um, it, it was a moment of, of deep empathy, I think, uh, for the other. I think a lot of American Jews can pass um, as whites, um, but, uh, and maybe, maybe many people see us simply as that. But um, when you start realizing that you're vulnerable, just as you know, you're our um, Christian, um, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu friends are vulnerable. It's 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 um, it's it, it's a revelation. Thank you for that. And I think in some ways that um, seeing the kind of interconnectedness of the experiences is 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 a big part of you know how we can really listen and be heard, which I think is, is, is really what we're all talking about here, both institutionally, interpersonally. Um, I'm looking at my run of show and I, 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 I am a t rule follower. So it is 458 and I have been told this is the time for me to thank the panel very much for your uh, words and your candor and your wisdom. Uh, it's really been a pleasure today. I, I see some hand clapping. I will clap here as well. Thank you very much. Um, and I will now turn it over to Melissa and, and, and thank you all. And I look forward to, to having coffee and, and having these conversations more in the months to come. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Definitely a virtual round of applause for our panelists and our moderator. And I as well am looking forward to conversations. This is the first of many. And so, you know, definitely stay connected to the, the panelists that you spoke with today and the moderator, as well as the Office of Religious Life and University Life. So once again, thank you to the Office of Religious Life, the panelists and moderator for sharing their time and experiences with our students.